Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship. Uh, so I hope that you're looking for us. If you are, you're in the right place. Of course, I just want to say welcome. We're so glad to have you with us. And we have a great presentation for you tonight. We have a couple of very small items of business to go over before we get started. First of all, show your love for Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship by following us on, joining us on meetup.com. Many of us, you found us there, but uh, you know, that's a great place. Also, uh, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter to get the very best CSC news. So I'll also announce our events and post when the videos are made public. Also, make sure you subscribe on Twitch and YouTube to get all the newest videos. We want to say thank you to Kirk Technology for sponsoring our meetup. We really appreciate their backing. And I also specifically want to thank the Software Craftsmanship organizing team. As always, I can't do this by myself, and there's a bunch of people behind the scenes helping out, and they deserve a ton of credit. So thank you to you, all you organizers out there. This is also a reminder to stick around after the talk. We'll be giving away a license for a JetBrains product. That's pretty awesome. After that, we'll also have a post presentation chat on Zoom. So don't jump off as soon as the talk is over. We also wanna let you know about our upcoming meetups. We've got some amazing stuff coming up. So first, next month on May 5th, Adrian, Adrian Taka, will be presenting Conducting Humane Code Reviews. And here to talk to us about that is Adrienne herself. Adrienne? Hey, hi. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Cincinnati Software Craftsmanship. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your talk? Absolutely. So um, I have always talked to my developer network and so something that we always kind of center on or fall onto really deep discussion on is something that is completely annoying with their code review process, <laughs> whether that's a branch policy, whether that's, you know, different opinions on what should be uh, searched for in a code review, if it's too late, if it should happen before, all of these kinds of things, there's so many different opinions. And so I kind of wanted to put all of these together and kind of give some of the best practices and lessons that I've learned uh, from my experience as a software engineer and just kind of help your team build what the best code review process is for you, but to do it in a way where you all still like each other afterward. <laughs> so definitely come to the next meetup because that will what this talk is going to be about. And I would definitely love to share all of those insights with you. Um, it's definitely something that is super important and yet so many people don't like it. Uh, we need to have more people embrace it and actually enjoy doing it because it's such an integral part of our process. That's awesome. I'm so excited for your talk, Adrian, and uh, really looking forward to that. You can actually go ahead and sign up for that talk right now on our LinkedIn page. We've got our, that LinkedIn, our LinkedIn event. We can drop that in the chat here in just a minute. You can also find that on meetup.com. So thank you again, Adrian. We're so excited to see you next month and uh, looking forward to it. Me too. Next, um, we have our June talk planned, which is going to be amazing as well. It's design for non-designers from a non-designer. I've seen this talk in the past, actually, quite some time ago, and it is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, be sure to check that one out as well. With that, I want to say welcome to Matt Eland. Can we get some applause in the chat for Matt? So we're super excited to have you here today, Matt. Thank you so much. And uh, I don't want to steal any more of your thunder. So let's talk about architecture. Thanks for having me, Michael. Um... Yeah, so uh, hi, I'm Matt Eland. Um, I'm in, up in the Columbus area, so a little distant from Cincinnati, but not too far. And I want to talk to you today about uh, just kind of an introduction to application architecture and uh, and scalability. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, probably the best way to follow me is by following me on on, on Twitter at Integerman. Uh, so you can uh, you can find me there. 
Um, I'm an instructor at Tech Elevator. I'll talk about who they are in a moment. But prior to that, I lived a uh, wonderful career as a uh, software developer working primarily in .NET and JavaScript technologies. Uh, I've been working with both for uh, about 20 years at various software as a service organizations, just trying to build software that scales and can be used by a multitude uh, of, of folks. Uh, so uh, with that, um, a little bit about my employer, Tech Elevator, who's uh, uh, gracious enough to let me uh, present on their behalf today. Uh, we are a software engineering boot camp uh, throughout the United States. Uh, we have a lot, a number of co campuses uh, in the northeastern United States, and that number is constantly growing. We also have a kind of a, na a nationwide live presence with a, a national live remote program uh, where we teach Java and C Sharp, as well as uh, uh, JavaScript, SQL, uh, a really full stack application development. Uh, if you're curious about us, you can find out more at techelevator.com. We have a number of free resources available to you as well, including uh, things like a free aptitude test and, and other things like that. A um, little bit more about me. A um, couple things I want you to know, first of all, uh, I have a wonderful wife and a adorable but very noisy terrier uh, who <laughs> I hope will not interrupt this, this talk with too much barking. This is about the time of day where he likes to get a little barky. Um, but uh, I also, uh, even though I, I left the active coding field, I still like to, to tinker with technology. So here are just a few of the uh, uh, of the things that I, I like to build. Uh, I've been doing a lot of game development recently, uh, project management software, a lot of stuff with .NET, JavaScript technologies. Uh, so that's just some of the nerdy stuff that you can expect if you follow me on Twitter. Um, but but talking about specifically about this talk while you're here today, uh, I like to give I like to say that I give about three different types of talks. I will give a talk which is really sort of a uh, you got this, you can do this, uh, a motivational kind of a thing. Uh, how do you you know you, you know just motivating you to do something and to get out there and uh, and have energy about coding. Uh, I also give kind of toolbox, uh, so, so sort of like deep dive oriented talks. Uh, so like, here's how you write a unit test, or here's how you work with this specific library, where I'm teaching you how to do one or two very specific things. Uh, so you can leave that that talk with those specific ex experiences and knowledge. Uh, and the third type of talk is what I call a toolbox talk, where I'm giving you um, a wide variety of things. I'm throwing a lot, a lot of concepts at you, uh, just to show you that there are tools out there to solve a specific problem so that you can look into each one more if you want to learn a little bit more. Uh, and that's really where we are today. As I'm, My goal today is to sort of help you understand some of the techniques out there for helping applications scale uh, so that you can look into the ones that you feel are most relevant to you and your projects and your organization at its various stages of life. Uh, so I'm going to be happy today uh, if you leave this talk with uh, an additional degree of comfort talking about software scalability and, and application architecture. Uh, I want you to have a little bit more knowledge on some of these things, especially some of these newer emerging things, um, because there's so much out there uh, related to software scalability and so much, so many things that could go into that conversation. Um, but, but I want you to have a, a, a greater degree of comfort. You're not necessarily going to know, okay, well, here's how I set up X, Y, and Z, but you'll know more about what they are and what their purpose is in an application. And I also want to caution you about some of the drawbacks of everything, because with software engineering, everything has trade-offs. Any decision you make has an upside and a downside. And so you need to understand that a lot of this cool technology and all these, these cool techniques, they have some real downsides with them sometimes as well. So you need to know sort of where the caution, uh, uh, where the obstacles lay. Uh, so those are my goals for you for this talk. Uh, so real quick, we're just going to start with an overview of some core concepts. Uh, and then I'm going to get right into the meat of the presentation, which is talking about various aspects of application scalability. Uh, we're going to, be, going to be talking primarily about web applications, though these techniques really apply to all kinds of applications, whether mobile or desktop or, or things like that. Um, but we'll talk about all sorts of different aspects of it, talking, starting with talking about the application or web server, uh, talking about the database layer, uh, talking about web APIs and uh, the front end concerns. And we'll close with sort of a more advanced concepts thing where we talk about microservices and things related to that. That's really where more of the, the bleeding edge uh, stuff is going to come in. And, and finally, I'll end with some final recommendations uh, for you if you are looking to um, build an application to scale um, and finding the right approach for you and your organizations. Uh, I do want you to, to put your questions in, in, uh, in Twitch. 
uh, and the event organizers will highlight some of those for me at uh, at various times throughout their presentation. And we have a lot of people here, so it's going to be hard to keep up with chat, unfortunately. Um, but they'll help me out. Uh, so <laughs> thank you in advance, organizers. Um, but this is a topic where we're going to be going from thing to thing to thing. So you're going to be better off if you can put your questions in in now versus waiting for the end, because we're going to be covering so many different types of things. Um, so just to make sure that everyone's on about the same uh, level, um, I want to talk more about like the various parts of an application before we dive into to, to deeper aspects of things. So in modern application, we have a lot of different parts to it. We've got um, some sort of an application, whether it's mobile or desktop or web application that runs in your browser. And typically these applications are going to make a web service call using some sort of a communications protocol to, an, to a, a server. It's a, a machine running some code um, that, that you or somebody else has written. And that server will give it back a response which you can use to display data or, or tell the user something or uh, some sort of data that can fuel that application, right? Um, usually the application server will have to talk to a database in order to store data and retrieve it later. Not always, but most of the time, the applications we write will, will work with one or more databases. And so usually they're using some sort of a query language. Um, for the purposes of this talk, a lot of the, the time when I say database, I'm talking specifically about a relational database, but we will talk a little bit about NoSQL databases once we hit the database the section. So uh, just so you're aware of, of what I mean with my terminology. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this the server aspect because that's changed quite a bit over the last 20 years of what a server is. Uh, back in the day, a server meant some sort of like a little computer blade that sat on a rack somewhere or in a closet if you were in a very small organization uh, and it ran your software. So I might build a web server and I'd run it on, on, on a box and connect it to the internet or a network and some application would connect to it. It'd send it requests and it would get back a response. Uh, and if I wanted another application, I'd get another server and I'd put it into a rack. And whether it's uh, our company running this data center or uh, uh, a, a data center downtown or, or something else like that, it, I have a server running in some data center or connected to the internet in some form. And if I wanted another application, I had to buy another uh, piece of hardware. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's what, we, what we mean by server. Uh, now, things changed a little bit when we said, well, wait a minute, I, I, I keep having to pay for all this hardware and all that. Why can't I get like a really big server uh, and, and run a lot of little, little things on it? And so we switched to this virtualized model where we had a really big server that has an operating system and it has something called a hypervisor. And that hypervisor can run multiple virtual machines on it. And these virtual machines are like, they're almost like fake instances of an operating system. It's an operating system that thinks it's running on its own machine. And so you have a, a, a virtual machine for one of your applications. If you need another application, you, you spin up another virtual machine. And, and it's running Linux, and it's running Linux. And uh, if you need another instance of your application, you can build another one. Um, and there's a lot of automation and, and things like that, like that that happen with this. And I, by, my, by no means, am an expert in any of this. Um, but this is sort of the, the model with a virtualized server model. And eventually we said, well, wait a minute, there's a whole lot of repetition going on. There's this, this machine is running Linux and this machine is running Linux and this machine is running Linux. Why are we storing that and paying for all the memory and the, and the, the disk space for all of that? Um, why don't we just find a way of reusing these dependencies? And so the things like Docker have come out where we have this containerized server model where we still have that one beefy server and it's, now it's running a container engine. It's running Docker. Uh, primarily, uh, and and it's running applications that are specifically built to run in containers for that container engine. And so these 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 Docker images say, hey, I depend on X, Y, and Z. And so the the engine will go out, it'll fetch whatever you need, and that those same dependencies can be shared by all the things that need it. And so as a result, with this containerized server model, uh, your one server, your one really big machine, can now host a lot more applications. Additionally. Uh, your developers can run the same containers on their machines, and those same containers can run in a, in a production, in a quality assurance, in a testing in type of environment, just with some different configuration parameters uh, that have come in. So this has been some of the changes in what an application is over uh, the last uh, few decade or so, uh, or more. Um, and then finally, um, all of this is no longer in, in our closet or in a data center uh, that we control. 
uh, more and more people are switching to a cloud server model where we have somebody like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud uh, providing a server for us. Uh, there is a saying of there is no uh, there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's uh, machine. Well, it's true, but that also means that you don't have to worry about security for your data center. You don't have to worry about cooling. You don't have to worry about power backups. You don't have to worry about um, potentially um, updating security settings for the operating systems. Um, they have a wide variety of offerings to help you get your applications up and running uh, easily. And that's sort of where we are nowadays. And, and cloud the cloud server model helps a lot of smaller organizations achieve the same scalability that a large organization might have with a large data center, uh, which is really cool. And it switches your large upfront investments of buying a server into more of a uh, an operational expense of renting a server from somebody else, which is cool. All right, so that's sort of our, our common um, starting point. Let's talk about scalability because that's why you're here. Uh, so apologies to you, uh, those of you who haven't had dinner yet, uh, but I like to make things fun. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to be talking to you about a fictitious organization today called Beredit. Now, Beredit is a, it is a Reddit clone. Uh, it's a hypothetical Reddit clone. And their business model is to make an application just like Reddit, except it's only for burrito-related content. So they've built a wonderful wide range of, of, of features for hosting burrito content. And they've hired a crack team of moderators that ban anybody immediately if they post anything not related to burritos. And now they figure that if they can just get a certain amount of daily active users, they're going to be profitable. And so that's where they are. And their marketing team is is for is focused on this, and they're trying to get more and more people to use it. Uh, and the hopes is they'll they'll profit. So I know ridiculous example, but um, I like to have a little bit of fun with things. And so as they start to grow, they start to have some performance issues. And usually when an organization is launching a new product and they start to get any number of really concurrent users, that's when uh, they start to have their first performance it, uh, problems show up. And with that, usually the first thing that you should do is rely on a tool called an application performance monitoring tool or an APM tool. Uh, this is a screenshot of New Relic, which is one of many APM tools. Um, but this is some software that you install on your web servers that it monitors the server's health, it monitors the traffic coming into the server, and the amount of time it takes to spend a res response out. It takes a look at where that traffic is going, uh, what status code is being returned, et cetera. And what this lets you do is it lets you track uh, the number of requests you get over time. So that's throughput. Uh, it lets you track the requests that error and when they error. It lets you track the places where you get the most um, uh, traffic or the places that are taking the longest amounts of time. And they can also tell you what areas of your code are spending, uh, your application is spending the most time on. Here, the blue is .NET code, uh, gold is uh, MS SQL, and then green, I think, is, is external API calls. So looking at this graph, we can say that, hey, they're, they're having some slowdowns uh, potentially related to their, uh, uh, their .NET code on their server. Uh, so this is an application performance monitoring tool. Um, there are many vendors out there. And in fact, a lot of these things are baked into cloud providers. If you want to opt in on that, I know Azure, uh, for example, has uh, uh, App Insights, which you can turn on your servers and get similar uh, similar details on it uh, to, to something like this. So APM tools can tell you what's slow. Uh, and that's really their job. They tell you, hey, you probably have a performance issue related to your database or it's related to your, your server on these specific pages. And this is really good for triaging performance problems. Another tool that we have available to us is if we think that a specific method of code is slow, uh, we can use something called a, prof a profiler. And profilers are going to be very different based on which languages and technologies you're using. Uh, but a profiler is something that looks at your code and it calls your method and it puts in extra, extra uh, instrumentation to get details out of a uh, out of that method on how the performance is, is impacting it. Uh, the difference between a profiler and an APM tool is an APM tool is designed to be run on your application in production, whereas a profiler is built to be run on a developer's desk and to take a really uh, detailed deep dive into why a particular method or set of methods are slow. Um, so different tools serve different purposes. 
But for Reddit's uh, purpose, we'll say that their servers are slow. So their web servers are slow. They're, they're starting to get a lot more usage and um, it, the users are just not having a good time. Uh, it's taking too long to get to get responses back. There's errors coming up. And the first thing that I like to recommend organizations do when, when they're a brand new organization, they're starting to encounter server performance issues for the first time, is I like to recommend that they scale up or they scale vertically. And with that model, you take your server, which you selected for really a really affordable server, uh, and you upgrade the RAM or you upgrade the CPU power. You, you move up to a, a next highest tier of server. Um, this is usually enough to buy you some time, get some responsivity back for your users, etc. cetera. Um, one warning on this is that when you do scale a server up, typically you have to take it offline. So the server goes down, your where website is now unavailable for a period of time, and now a new server comes up and that's your, that's your application server. Um, so this is something that's best done in the evenings or on the weekends during a planned maintenance period. Sometimes you may need to do it in, in, in an emergency during an outage, uh, but hopefully that is rare and limited to the early days of a startup. Uh, secondly, let's talk about how. Uh, a lot of the examples I'm gonna give you today are from Azure because I have the most experience with Azure, uh, but, the, uh, but uh, AWS and Google Cloud, all, they have the equivalent of, of most of these things I'm showing you today. Uh, so if we wanted to scale up in a cloud provider, we could move, but we can just go into the server that we're working with and change the tier of it uh, to be a higher grade. So if we were working with this uh, with this server right here, we could double its its uh, its memory and double its processing power and the like. And we can keep doubling it and keep doubling it if we need to. Um, but that gets expensive and that gets harder and harder to, to justify on a growing business. So that's one trade-off of scaling vertically is that the price tends to double. Uh, another downside of it is you don't always need the same level of horsepower from your application. So for example, uh, if you're running a traditional application that, that's used to serve uh, people who are working during the workday, well, you have something called peak hours where you will, you're getting not a lot of usage at around 3 a.m., but as the workday starts, you get an increased amount of usage and you have peak usage, you know, maybe uh, mid morning or mid afternoon. And some days might have more usage than others as well. If you're running on a single server and you're scaling vertically, you need a server that's gonna be able to handle your peak, your, your highest peak, and then and then a little bit of wiggle room too. Um, but you're paying for that same processing power, even in, your, in the times when you get no requests coming in. Uh, and, and so that's a bit of an inefficiency. And so in order to fight that, we use something called horizontal scaling, we're scaling out. So instead of scaling up or scaling vertically, we're now scaling out. And with horizontal scalability, we now have multiple servers. These servers all look the same. They're all running our, sa our same application code. Uh, and these are potentially smaller servers uh, in terms of, of their memory and CPU and, and the like, but we've got a lot of them. Uh, and we have something new called a load balancer. And when a request comes in from your application, the load balancer says, hey, I know about these three servers. I'm, I'm gonna give the next request to server one. And the next request comes in, oh, that's going to server two. And then server three, and it kind of goes round robin and it gives it to all of the healthy servers it knows about. And by doing it this way, um, this lets us sort of add and potentially remove uh, servers from our pool of servers to dynamically respond to the level of traffic that we're seeing. Um, and the nice thing about this compared to vertical scalability is that scaling horizontally doesn't uh, cause an outage. So we no longer lose uh, service for our users. So if the application starts to get overwhelmed, we add a new server. The server boots up. It checks itself to make sure it's okay. It tells the load balancer it's now online. Load balancer is now going to start giving it requests. The user has no idea that they just moved to a new server for the first time. Traffic dies down. Well, we remove it from the, from the, from the pool and then we take out the server offline. And this is what we call elasticity, where we have this, this running pool of servers, which scales up and down based on the amount of traffic that we're getting at a given point in time. So we only pay for the server uh, utilization level that we need, uh, which is really attractive from a, um, uh, from a pricing perspective. This is one of the uh, advantages of going with a cloud service provider. We call it cloud agility. Um, the way we set this up typically is we set up some rules. So we can say, hey, when the server is, uh, when the, the pool of servers has an average CPU utilization of greater than 70% for 10 minutes, then I want you to add another server to your pool. 
So that's a scaling out rule. Now we can scale back in a little bit. Uh, if the average CPU utilization is less than 35% uh, for 10 minutes, then scale it up and down. You can set some limits too. So you don't necessarily have to <laughs> wake up and find out that you paid for 450 instances of your server to be running overnight or something like that. Uh, you can also add in rules for uh, things like scheduling. So, hey, I know that usage starts to pick up around noon. At 10 o'clock, let's always move up to three servers, no matter what, even if nobody's using it. Or the weekend, we don't need to have another server up. So those are kind of some, uh, some of the concerns that we have on the uh, web server side. Uh, this is a great time for questions, if there's any that the organizers would like to, uh, uh, to highlight. Um, but I will take a moment and uh, rehydrate myself. I saw one about um, web server versus app server. Here we go. Mm. If you want to talk about that at all. Yeah. They're, those are, uh, so the, what's the difference between a web server and an app server is the question. Um, they're not quite the same. Uh, a web server will serve up um, HTML content as well as uh, potentially responding to API requests in an app server. Um, it might not have a, a specific user interface, but the scalability concerns are about the same. So there, there is a difference, but um, it, it, it doesn't matter as much in terms of scalability would be my response to that. Thank you. Uh, and I yeah. saw one here asking that is the container the same as the VM? Yeah. So uh, container is sort of a different flavor of a VM. A container is about the same thing as a VM minus the operating system baked into it. So a container is, is sort of like a, a half slice of that, uh, of that uh, VM. It's only the application we care about. It's, it's probably the best way to think about it. Excellent. And uh, this one, maybe we'll hit one more. I don't want to pause for too long here. Uh, is there a scaling up or out process with databases? Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that next. Uh, great Cool. Question. Sounds good. Uh, I do see one here. Can the load balancer mm -hmm. get overwhelmed with requests? If so, how can you uh, how can you protect from this or prepare for the worst case scenario? Um, potentially, I've my experience is very limited when it comes to that. I sort of let uh, somebody like Azure or AWS take care of that for me. Um, However, if I'm running my own web, uh, my own load balancer, I imagine that it could. Uh, my experience doesn't really let me answer that question, unfortunately. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that I know a bit about, but not a lot about, um, because it's it's a learning journey, and this is a very wide array, array of topics. Uh, great questions. Uh, I'm going to keep on moving. Uh, we'll talk about databases, because I think databases are a really important part of scalability. So Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so the question a bit ago was about scaling up versus scaling out on the database. And we saw with, with Beredit that uh, by scaling up and scaling and then scaling out their, their server, they were able to handle um, peak traffic pretty efficiently. Uh, however, that's not the entirety of scalability concerns because that will get you a certain amount of the way there. But at a certain point, you're going to have performance issues again. Uh, and this is often a surprise for folks who think they've solved the issues with their server. Uh, and the reason why this becomes an issue is because even with a load balancer and horizontal scalability, you might be able to handle 43 requests a second or 43,000 requests a second. Um, and they're going to any number of, of servers. Uh, but those servers are all typically working with the same database. And so each one of these requests might need to have about five queries to be run uh, to handle it. Right, and those queries are all going to go to that same database server. And so there is a certain point where you're going to have too many queries to this database server for it to be able to, to keep up with. So databases have their own set of scalability concerns, and the first solution to the database scalability concerns is the first solution to uh, the server the scalability concerns, where we scale up. We take our small database server and we scale it up to a, to a larger uh, machine. So we're using a a bit more memory. We're using a bit more processing power. And particularly, we are paying a lot more attention to the hard drive. We are using solid state drives instead of a hard drive. We are using premium solid state drives instead of uh, solid state drives. Because input output speed is one of the most critical factors of a database in terms of its performance. Um, the problem with this is that as we grow our database, 
the prices tend to grow a lot more because you have a lot more people using your database. And so therefore you need to store a lot more of your data. Um, so you, not only do you need to move from a hard drive to an SSD, which is more expensive, but then a premium SSD and a premium SSD that can handle a massive amount of data. Um, and so the pricing tends to catch up with you pretty quickly on when you need to scale your, your, your database server uh, vertically. However, it's usually a good move to, to scale it vertically once, maybe twice uh, or early on for an organization. So usually once you start encountering database performance issues for the first time, um, working on focusing on your queries and their performance becomes an ongoing part of your organization. It becomes a part of many sprints uh, if you're running in an agile process, which most organizations are these days. Um, where every, every, time, every time we're developing features, we now need to pay a little bit more attention to the queries that, that, that we're running, making sure they're hitting on um, proper indexes in the database. I don't have a lot of time to talk about indexes or query optimization today, um, but there are some fantastic resources out there on the interwebs uh, to find more if you're interested. But this matters more um, because this database server tends to be a, bo a bottleneck and you usually have three or four tables that are where most of your performance issues start to uh, start to impact. Um, and so this becomes an ongoing part of your, your, your maintenance uh, process. We'll talk about some solutions for this at the end of this section. And then at the, at the end, when we're talking about some more advanced concepts, um, but this is just going to be part of your ongoing um, operational uh, expenses is, is devoting developer time to it. Maybe getting a, a database uh, engineer, database analyst, uh, if you're a smaller organization. Um, now the question earlier was about scaling up and scaling out. Uh, and so if we can scale up, well, we should be able to scale out, right? Well, it's not as easy as you think. Um, if we're scaling out, then you might think that, okay, well, when I have an app server, why can't it just have a database server associated with it? So one database server for this and one database server for this and one database server for this. It, this looks like it should work, but when you think about it, we'll say, okay, well, I had a really nice burrito for lunch. I'm going to upload a picture of it. So I make a request, I'm going to post a new burrito picture and the load balancer sends it to app server one, which puts it in database server one. Great. No problem. Now my wife comes in and she wants to put a comment on it or like it. And she says, Hey, I want to find the, uh, I want to find the, the burrito picture that my husband just posted. And so she makes a request to the server and it routes her to app server three and says, okay, Hey, give me, give me, uh, give me photos by map. And it doesn't find it because it's not in that database server. This is sort of why we can't scale horizontally this way. Um, horizontal scalability with a database is a lot more complex, unfortunately, where we need to work on something called partitioning or sharding. Uh, I like the term partitioning a lot better than I like the term sharding. Um, but in a partition model, we take our large database and we split it into multiple smaller databases. So imagine if you have a bunch of customers in your database with uh, with various letters of their of their names, etc. You can take your database and you can say, hey, these data, these sets of data don't really interact. So I'm going to take all my customer data from this to this, and I'm going to put in one database, and this to this, and put in another database. And so we now we have a, a number of smaller databases that have less rows in them. Uh, and so my traffic can go to the right database. And this, this, this multiple database kind of a model, this partition database model, it buys us a little bit more time uh, before each database starts to get more issues. Um, but it also gives us the option of repartitioning. So it's like, okay, well, we have a whole lot of customers with the last name of G uh, that starts with a G. So let's give those their own partitioned instance. This, this, this kind of a strategy is usually what you'll do in a relational database model um, for handling things. Unfortunately, you need to, this is often a lot of work if you're not planning on it. Um, this is a major project and you have to get it right uh, or you're going to have a lot of errors, a lot of really upset customers and potentially lost data as well. There are databases that can handle partitioning just out of the box. It's becoming more and more of a common thing, um, but it's going to vary by which technologies you use. A common solution to get away from this, this, uh, this type of a problem is to go with something called a NoSQL database. I don't like the term NoSQL because some of them actually have SQL involved, um, but these are, are these uh, these are non-relational databases. These are these are different than our our, our tables and relations uh, approaches. And there's about four major flavors of these. Uh, these are specialized types of databases that say, okay, well we don't need as much of the advanced querying capabilities that a relational database gets us. 
and we don't need as much of the schema enforcement and safety uh, constraints that a, that a, rela a relational database gets us. We really need a couple a uh, couple things, and these things tend to be partition be part horizontally partitioned out of the box, where you say, "Hey, uh, it's going to automatically split things based on their keys or whatever." It's going to be different for based on each different database provider, but these things tend to hit to be a little bit more. Um, permissive, uh, a little less rules associated with them, um, but also they, they scale better uh, horizontally out of the box. Uh, so the four uh, the types uh, types in, in brief, um, you got a key value uh, database, which is where everything has a unique key and it stores some piece of data, uh, whether it's a number, a string, or some JSON. Think about um, a dictionary in .NET or uh, also called a map in other programming languages. Uh, this is really the, the sort of a, a, of a, a structure that a, that a key value database would have. Um, related to this, and a little bit of a step up from this, is a document database. This is what the most common type people mean when they talk about NoSQL databases. Um, a document database is you're storing JSON data, and you have some additional tools for, uh, for doing joins and some additional tools for um, ensuring that data matches a specific uh, schema. Um, this is this is really your your most common type of, of, of database a NoSQL database that you'll find is a NoSQL database um, and there's a number of vendors out there and they all work a little bit differently um, but they're trying to give you a little bit more freedom than you might have with a standard uh, relational database uh, and that same horizontal scalability as well the downside is that querying becomes harder uh, reporting becomes a little harder upgrading versions becomes harder if you needed to change your schema a little bit uh, the, the, everything in software has trade-offs. Um, let's talk a little bit about more about column family. I like to think about column family databases or wide column databases as a as sort of a tagging kind of a system. It's where you have a, a, a table with a lot of rows, but each of these rows can have multiple different columns, uh, and those columns don't have to be the same as they are in other in other rows. You know, kind of an interesting approach. Um, this is probably the, the type I know the least amount, and, and I'm not really a database guy, unfortunately. Uh, everybody has their, their strengths and weaknesses, and this is more of my weaknesses area. Um, but it might be an option for you and your application. Uh, depends on what type of data you're trying to store. Um, the last type is very specialized. It's a graph uh, database. Uh, this is the one that intrigues me the most. Uh, with a graph database, it's really in intended more for like a social kind of an application where you have a lot of relationships between your data. So you, you'll have uh, vertices or nodes, and they will, will represent somebody. So think about uh, LinkedIn or Facebook or something like that. You have a person, and that person has a, a, num a number of attributes associated with them, where they work, uh, their name, their location, um, various things like that, right? Uh, and they'll also have relationships to other users, and these can be uh, sort of unidirectional. Like on Twitter, uh, let's say Johan here follows Peter. The, Peter doesn't necessarily follow them back. So that relationship is a is an edge, uh, and there might be data associated with that, like the date which they followed, the content they're interested in, something like that. Uh, this type of a database is really good for finding uh, recommendations. So uh, online shopping centers will be able to say, hey, people who bought product X and product Y or had X and Y in their carts at the same time often had this thing over here. Uh, and so you, this is really good for generating recommendations uh, and, and things like that. So NoSQL is awesome and interesting. It has some trade-offs though. So just things to keep in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about database performance and scalability uh, as we close today. Um, but what questions have come up in, in chat uh, that uh, we might be able to talk about here? There's been a lot of discussion about NoSQL and stuff See, like that. Does that scare you? <laughs> it does scare me. This is an area I know very little about. Uh, so the great news is that last month we had a talk on NoSQL, and we're going to mm -hmm. drop that link in the chat here in just a minute. Um, but you may want to check that out because that was quite a broad uh, talk about NoSQL and about data modeling. So yeah, and just, that might give, be useful just to give that speaker some props, that was uh, Matt Groves, who's also an organizer uh, alongside me at the uh, centralohio.net developer group or Condig. So uh, go Matt, that was a good talk. Uh, Matthew rather, I'm not gonna give him my name. Uh, <laughs> all right, so that really was a fantastic introduction uh, to, the, to that top topic in more detail as well. 
but let's talk a little bit more about uh, the APIs. And I talked earlier about the web server, and the web server will have a lot of uh, a lot to do with helping APIs scale as well as the database. But there are some specific concerns related to APIs that I think that we need to talk about. Uh, because if you have a bad API or a bad API implementation, it can cause you to focus more on scalability than you otherwise might have. The very first thing I want to talk about with, with, with APIs is, is rate limiting. As soon as you start hitting uh, any sort of high, higher levels of usage, uh, you know, more and more people using your application, you need to start thinking about adding something called rate limiting. With rate limiting, you look for some sort of an identifier on an incoming request, whether it's an IP address or an API key or an authorization header or something like that. And you say, hey, I can only get X requests from this identifier in Y period of time. So customers should only be able to send me 100 requests in a minute, for example. And if you, if you pass, the, if you send me under that limit, then fine. But if you go past that, the server is going to automatically spit back uh, 429, too many requests, as well as some metadata on when you can next request data. This is really good for protecting yourself against the denial of service attack or a mistake on behalf of a customer. Uh, the very first time I needed to implement rate limiting was after we discovered that a customer of ours had tried to build an auto refresh plugin uh, to a dashboard that was using our, our site as da for data. And they... They made a mistake with the JavaScript, and they forgot to set the interval at, at which the, the page should refresh its data. And so their page sent as many requests as it could in a given second. And it overwhelmed our, our pool of servers. It overwhelmed our database because it was hitting a really heavy uh, page. And so not only could that person not get the data they wanted, but anybody else trying to use that same pool of servers, um, the application just couldn't couldn't keep up. So by, by, by adding in rate limiting, as soon as you start to get sustained usage, you're protecting yourself from accidental or malicious attacks, uh, and you need it sooner than you think. Um, thankfully, there's things like API gateways and the like, which, can, which you can configure to do this automatically for you. Um, I know, uh, for example, that uh, Azure has an uh, API gateways um, offering, which, which lets you just check a box uh, to, to opt in on this, uh, for a fee, of course. Um, but something like this is really, really, really important in a growing application. Um, another thing that can make things get a little bit better uh, if you're getting a lot of requests for, for the same types of content is caching. Uh, so with a cache, let's say that uh, I am going to bread it. I'm going to grab a list of, of burritos for the main page. The, like, hey, what, what do people have for lunch today? I go in and I say, hey, server, I'd like the list of, uh, of burritos for today. And it, it does the query and it gives back the data. And then I, I see the list over here. Uh, now my neighbor goes into the site because, of course, he uses the, the site as well, and he makes the same requests. And his neighbor and his sister and everybody's making the same requests. Well, that server is getting the same query over and over and over again. With a cache, when it makes their request, it stores the result in the cache. Um, and so it says, hey, you want a list of, uh, of, of data for the front page. Cool. I'm going to store it in the cache. It's going to be good for two minutes or whatever time length I, I say. And so when the next person goes in, they request the same piece of data. It says, hey, Cash, do you have anything for this specific key? It's like current burritos. Oh, yeah, I do. Here you go. And it doesn't even talk to the database server. And once it expires, it'll query it again and it'll store it in the cache. So caching can drastically improve your application performance. It can drastically remove or reduce the amount that you need to worry about database scalability early on which is really, really important because that can be very expensive and it's a lot harder to scale the database than it is to scale the server. The downside of caching is that your server now needs to fit it into memory or you need to use a dedicated caching provider like Redis or something like that. Um, and if you ever get an update operation on, on something or something that would impact the data that's stored in the cache, your cache now stores invalid data. So now you need to worry about cache and validation. So you need to say, hey, I updated this picture of burrito to have this comment or something like that. So, okay, well, now I need to update the cache. And if other people are using the shared cache, then they'll get it too. Uh, it, it, so caching can actually introduce a lot of different types of bugs. So it increases the complexity of our applications, but it's often worth it in terms of uh, the productivity gains that we get uh, for not having to worry as much about database server scalability. 
Um, so that's that's caching in a nutshell, and it's a it's a very complicated topic. It has a lot more aspects than that, but that's the basics of caching. Another thing that I would like to encourage that I've seen multiple organizations do uh, wrong is to avoid polling. So if you were implementing a new feature, let's say we want to have a little bell in our upper right that lights up whenever somebody likes a picture you posted or comments on uh, what you had for lunch. Um, one, of the, one of the easiest ways of doing that is having your, your web page periodically make a request to the server and say, hey, uh, do you have any new notifications for me? No. OK, cool. I'll ask in 15 seconds. How about now? No. How about now? No. Go away. And as soon as somebody um, you know makes that comment or likes it, well, now you get a notification waiting for you. And 15 seconds later, you request it. You get the, the thing back. Uh, this is a really easy way of doing it. You know, it's a request response, um, and it's not too hard to automatically check something from a web page. The problem is, if you've got a thousand people using this and they're all on lunch and they leave their their web page open, well, you got a thousand requests every 15 seconds. And we've actually seen graphs at various places I've worked of like these, these constant low level requests coming in from after hours of people who left their desks and uh, you know, we're still getting 300 requests a minute uh, up until midnight. Uh, so this, this can actually really, really, really matter in terms of your application's performance. Now caching can help a lot, but a better model to do uh, is to use uh, something like WebSockets. Uh, in the .NET world, we use something like SignalR which the client will open a connection to the server and say, hey, I'm here, tell me about anything that relates to me. And as soon as that external event comes in, it says, hey, I know about you, here's a WebSocket notification, a WebSocket message, here's your new net message. We're not constantly checking and communicating. It's technically, it's a little bit more advanced, but this can really reduce the, uh, the load on your server, which is really important too. Uh, along those lines, if you're trying to reduce the amount of calls that are going to your server, instead of having your application make a lot of little calls for various pieces of data, you can use something like GraphQL. With GraphQL, you have an advanced API where somebody can, can write effectively a, a query in JSON or JSON-like syntax um, and say, hey, I want things for user 42. Uh, I only care about their name and their list of projects. And on those projects, I only care about the, the name, the ID, and the tasks. And on those tasks, I only care about the name and the ID. And you can do all sorts of crazy filtering, et cetera. And you give this complicated request to the server and your server handles it. And it says, okay, I need to, to query these four tables and I need to join and do all these other things. With logic that you write, you know, largely you're writing, um, but it's one request to your server. The server talks to the database one time and the server spits back all that data. And if your client ever needs another piece of data, you modify your query. Your server doesn't necessarily even need to be modified at all. So GraphQL is a really interesting way of reducing the amount of requests that are coming into your server. Admittedly, those requests are now taking a little bit longer because they're doing more, but having less overhead for communication is making things faster on the client side, and it's ultimately going to make things faster for your server and your performance. Um, so that's something to check into for sure. All right. So that's APIs. We'll talk about front end next, but I'll pause for a drink and, uh, and, and, and questions. So I've seen a few things about GraphQL. Um, some stuff about scaling API calls. Uh, I see a question about recommendations on books and best articles for YouTube videos for system design and scalable architecture. I have some book recommendations at the end of this per, uh, in this in this presentation. Uh, great, uh, a great question. Um, and I see another question from the same user actually of uh, talking about database scalability in terms of uh, read versus write. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that uh, in, in the closing section here. Uh, so just about five minutes from now. And <laughs> I love that question. Will we go over CDN? Yes, <laughs> we will definitely go over CDNs. <laughs> uh, it's great. Um, I'm not sure I can easily talk about that. Um, so keeping the cash fresh, uh, I'm not That's sure. Yeah, I, I'm but not it's sure. Two hard problems, right? Yeah, yeah. Cash and validation is a very, very hard problem. Um, 
I, I, I would I would push you more towards some in-depth resources on something like Redis uh, for that question. Uh, I don't think I'm the guy to answer that question for you, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's still growing. <laughs> it's a fantastic tool, but you have to use it with care. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, lots of seams for things to get in, uh, get get into your application for for invalid state to get in. We'll talk actually about some 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 solutions that avoid uh, caching entirely uh, in the in the advanced section in a bit. Um, and yeah, long polling. I, uh, I actually have slides on long polling, but uh, I, I have too many slides for the amount of time that I have. So uh, if you're curious <laughs> about long polling, hang out in the, the talk afterwards. I'll talk more about that. Um, Sounds good. But good questions. All right. So Beretta is now growing. Um, you know, it's the world's leading burritos as a service company, which is now apparently a category of things. Um, it's really, really, really doing well in the States, but overseas, it's not doing so great. People are saying the app is slow, it's hard to use, et cetera. Um, and when they're talking about this type of a speed issue, they're usually talking about latency or lag. Um, and what this means is if I have all my content hosted in a data center out west in the Western United States, uh, well, I might be fine over here in Cincinnati, but somebody over in India or Australia or the UK, you know, they're they're having to, to wait for the data to go across uh, the oceans uh, to the data center and then back to them. And that can actually add, you know, significant amounts of, of, of time to, to every request. You know, we're talking up to half a second or more, uh, per request, um, which is a serious issue in a large application. So one of the things that we do is we look to make the size of our, our resources as small as possible so that this problem is, uh, reduced as much as we, we can. Um, we typically will rely on something like minification where we'll have our build tools uh, take our JavaScript or CSS or potentially even HTML and, uh, and minify it. We'll, we'll take it and we'll, we'll have it be the same exact code as far as, far, as far as the JavaScript interpreter goes, but we'll remove the line breaks. We'll remove the uh, any sort of white space that we can, can get rid of. We will rename variables to uh, where we can uh, we're going to do whatever we can to make it as small as possible while still um, while still doing the same thing. So this is the process of minification, and usually, you know, the developers will still work with the full version, but something like WebCAC uh, will will take that and ship the minified versions, and that's usually a, like, a, like a .min.js. And you might not think that this matters too much, uh, but this can significantly improve the speed of downloading a large application from a slow internet app, uh, from a slow, slow or distant internet connection. Um, talking specifically about that distance that we were talking about a second ago, one way of combating that lag uh, or latency is by using CDNs, which we had the question on a second ago, uh, or CDNs are content delivery networks. And the idea of a CDN is that you're using some sort of an external uh, service like Cloudflare or Verizon or something like that. And you're using their servers to host some of your static content, like your CSS, your HTML, your JavaScript, and you're taking your, your maybe even some logos or images, uh, and you're putting these on their servers. And these these CDN, these CDN nodes, are servers throughout the, the globe that are looking at one central source of truth, right? They're looking at your server, and periodically they're pulling in uh, new resources. And they get a request for something they don't know about, but it's in the, in, in the, the CDN gets added to their CDN and it lives there for some period of time, like a week or something like that. Um, the upside of this is that, you know, people are talking to a, a CDN node near them and they're getting the data out of that, uh, which can significantly improve their, their speeds in working with their app, with your application. The downside of this is that a, it's another thing that can break uh, and CDN providers do break periodically. Uh, B, it can take a while for new versions of your application or new versions of your files to be pushed to these CDN nodes. So you, you'll sometimes need to worry about caching or sorry, flushing the, uh, the CDNs to, to, to have them pull your new, your new content. Um, but this can significantly improve the uh, experience that your overseas users are, uh, are encountering. Um, with that, let's talk a little bit more about some of the more advanced stuff that we've been teasing for a while now. Um, so, you know, Beretta is the thing that won't stop growing. Uh, and now we need to start thinking about really big stuff, really big solutions to some of our problems. Um, 
getting back to databases, we had a question a while ago about read versus write performance. Uh, one of the things that makes databases slow, specifically re relational databases, is something called locking. With a lock, uh, you, your database will often have a lock on a specific row. Um, so let's say I'm writing a query to update or a user record or a project record or a burrito record or something like that, right? So something trying to query it, it has to wait for that lock to get released or if something else is trying to update it. It also has to wait, wait uh, for that lock to be released. And so if I've got rows that are constantly being updated, then it doesn't matter how fast my database is because it, it can't handle 10,000 requests for the same row if everybody's always grabbing a lock and having to wait in line single file for it. Uh, so locking is often why uh, our databases become slow. Um, so there's strategies around that and, and, and trying to reduce that. Uh, but there's there's really interesting new, newer technology that, that's, uh, uh, that really helps with that. It's something called event sourcing. And with event sourcing, everything in your database is now an event. So an event might be, hey, I uploaded a picture of what I had for lunch. Okay, well, the picture and any metadata associated with that gets stored in the database as an event. So the event is Matt inserted a picture. And, and I say, oh, no, I misspelled something on the, on, on the header. I need to be able to edit that. So I send it an edit. Well, that edit is no longer an update on that same row. It's now a new event. So Matt is editing this row. And here's the new value for, for the title. And oh, I misspelled it again. I, I, I forgot to attribute it to my wife uh, or something like that. And so I'm sending in another edit event. This, these, these writes, these are all inserts. I don't have to worry at all about uh, waiting for a lock on a row that I'm trying to update. Instead, I am now focused on writing new values or inserting new values into my database. So my database is now very tall. My tables are tall. They have a lot of little events. Um, and if I ever want to see the state of something, I am now pulling relevant events. So like, okay, well, post 42, uh, give me all the events related to that. Okay, I see an insert. I see an edit and I see another edit. Okay, well, I need to rehydrate this. I need to figure out how to how that entity should look now. So, okay, so if we inserted it and then we edited the title this and we edited this, okay, it should look like this now. And so we can kind of do some, some advanced uh, reconstruction on things coming out of the database. So this is a database almost built just for writes, uh, just for inserts uh, and not for um, updates. Um, so that's, that's kind of an interesting approach uh, to things. Uh, another uh, thing that we can do for database performance is we can optimize things for reading by using something like a read replica. So many databases can have a near real time synchronization using something called a read replica, where we have our database that we write to and we can potentially read from it as well, but it also will write periodically to a read replica, uh, potentially many read replicas. And things that don't need data that's exactly current and don't need to write to that data, they can be pointed at the read replica. And that reduces problems of things waiting for write locks on your primary database. Uh, at the expense of potentially reading data that's a little out of date. So that's sort of the idea of a read replica, and you'll often see that in terms of, of uh, reporting applications or things like that. You can kind of combine these two ideas into something with a long name that I hate, but it's actually a very accurate name for what it is. Uh, it's called Command Query uh, Responsibility Segregation, or CQRS. With CQRS, um, we have a uh, we have a separate service in code for handling writes. We call that co the command service or writes or updates. They go to the command service and they write to the database. And things that are uh, involving reads go to the query service and they read from the database. And that might be a, a separate database. So it could be a read replica, or you could be using something like event sourcing and you're storing a whole bunch of events in this database. And periodically, you have another process that pulls these, these new events. And it, it, it says, OK, well, if we have all these events related to this item, then the current state of this should be x. And now it writes it into a table in this query database, um, which is designed to be very, very accurate uh, in terms of uh, querying it. So, the point of a query database is you don't have to do as much um, joining and things like that. Your reads are going to be very quick. 
they might be a little delayed because this is now using something called eventual consistency. We know it's eventually going to, these updates are eventually going to propagate over to here, but it's not going to be immediate. Uh, but this, this is sort of a, a, a system designed to avoid the need to cache. Uh, your, your writes are going to be very quick um, and your reads are going to be very quick. The downside of it is it's more complexity because you have, you know, two of everything to worry about. Um, and you have this delay uh, between the write and it showing up in the read potentially. Um, so that's CQRS. It's a really interesting pattern to look at. Um, it's it, it says a lot about per performance and scalability and the like. Um, that's really cool. Um, so let's talk about another thing. <laughs> I know I'm going over all sorts of different uh, different things, giving you little pieces of candy. Uh, uh, hopefully you like that. But uh, uh, if not, well, I guess it's what you're what you're getting today. Uh, sorry, but uh, with domain-driven design, this is something that came about in the early 2000s, um, but it's a lot more relevant now um, with microservices. Uh, but with domain-driven design, we are looking at uh, at our data. There's a lot of things in domain-driven design, but the aspect I want to talk about is how we structure our data with it. We have something called an aggregate root, which is where we have something that's like sort of like the the root that a, a, lot, of, a lot of other things are related to. So. In a purchasing system, we might have customers, and we might have products, and we might have a lot of things related to products, and we might have a lot of things related to customers. Well, we would have a customer context and a product context in that case. And we can kind of structure our code to be oriented around the product context and around the customer context. And we start to separate our code and our data out from, from each other a little bit more. This helps with uh, a lot of different things. But one of the things it helps us with is with scalability. Um, so if you look at your data model this way, you can start to say, well, well, wait a minute. Why do I have one database that holds both thing, both contexts? Why can't I introduce an, a, a database just for the customers and a database just for the products? And it might be that I might want a relational database for my products and a NoSQL database for my customers. Um, and that's fine. You know, we can structure our data technology based on what we're trying to store in there. Um, so this is an alternative to horizontal scalability with the database. So instead of partitioning things, we're now sort of chopping our database up into smaller databases, um, which is really interesting. So now we have one app, web, one web application that relies on two databases. And the logic in our code is separated based on customers and products. Okay, So that's sort of one of the places domain-driven design can take us. Uh, another uh, if we if we evolve this concept a little bit more, uh, you can say, well, wait a minute, why do I have code for this and code for this in the same app? These are really sort of separate things, and you can start, you can split it in half. You can say, well, wait a minute, I got a customer service with its own database and a product service with its own database, and you get these little things which we have come to call microservices. And in a microservice kind of an ar architecture, we have a lot of these little services that can communicate with each other. In, in one of two major ways is how they communicate. Um, microservices are not the answer to every problem. Uh, they have some, tr some trade-offs, which I'll talk about in a second. But one of the things they're really good at solving is when your organization gets too big to have too many developers working on the same project. So microservices exist to help a larger organization, a larger team work on a large app by splitting it into smaller apps, which are easier for individual teams to think about. Um, the downsides of my microservices are, there's, there's a number of them. Um, one of the downsides is it becomes a lot harder to think about your application as a whole, because now you have, it's, it's harder to trace a request all the way from one system to another and figuring out how it winds up through, through everything. It's harder to, to organize changes potentially. Uh, it's harder for any one person to understand exactly what's going on in your system. Uh, and that makes it harder uh, for you to debug your, your your issues. It also makes it a lot easier for bugs to fall through the cracks between between teams. A new a new bug comes in, and one team says it's the other team's fault, and the other team says, well, no, they're not doing this. And who's really owning that? Uh, and so it makes it easier for bugs to thrive, in my experience. Another issue that you can have, is specifically with this way of communicating with the microservices, if they're talking directly to each other, is what happens if there's a networking issue? What happens if a database goes down for a second or gets overwhelmed? How do you handle a customer ordering something um, if 
a service goes down. You know, and now it's a lot more likely that a, uh, a user is going to see an error because because of something like this. Um, so this is the, the natural way for us to think about building a, a microservice architecture is to have these sort of direct communication lines going on. Um, but there's a better way of doing this uh, using something called event-driven architectures. With event-driven architectures, we're worrying about publishing events uh, to something called an event broker or an event hub. Um, so the shopping microservice says, hey, I got a request for something. I'm going to publish an event saying user bought item. Billing service might get an event saying, hey, uh, I got a request to bill Mr. Smith $50 for a burrito poster, uh, whatever it might be. And it publishes this event uh, to the event broker. It doesn't need to worry about who's consuming the event. It just needs to know about what information is in this event. The other side of this is, so this is the publish side of this. There's also the subscribe side of things where, th where the billing ser service says, hey, I want to know when somebody buys something. The logging service says, hey, just tell me about like most things. <laughs> Inventory ser service says, hey, I need to know when something was bought, when somebody was actually billed, et cetera. Um, and so these, these events that these individual microservices are publishing are called topics. And we can subscribe to these topics. Um, so our inventory service might subscribe to a purchase topic, for example, right? And that request is gonna go into this little queue. So there's gonna be a queue for the inventory microservice to get requests, uh, new requests from. And so it says, hey, there's a new request. You don't really need to know about the shopping service at all. You just need to know about this, this topic. So when, when a new event comes in, react to that event and do whatever you need to, put whatever you need to in your database, publish your own events if you need to, whatever. The, this, the presence of these, um, of these queues is actually really, really, really helpful for scalability concerns because if a system goes down, if a system becomes overwhelmed or is very slow, well, the message is still in the queue. It's still in the inventory microservices queue. When it comes back up, it's going to be able to handle it. Uh, or we can add another inventory micro or another instance of that service to a load balancer somewhere. And it's going to be able to pull the request from the queue and keep up with it. We don't know when it's going to happen, but you know, sometime within the next hour or so, it, it's going to handle it. And, and sort of this is sort of an event-driven architecture. It's not right for every type of an application. An application where you need an immediate response to a user request uh, is this is not what that's for. But if you're purchasing something or making a request for some, some sort of assistance or something like that, this can be really helpful. Uh, so in conclusion, we've looked at how to scale the server, the web services, the database, the front end, uh, and then some more of these advanced or mo more modern uh, types of scalability. Um, you may be wondering how you get started with some of this stuff, especially if you're newer to development. Um, I like to point people to uh, to Azure as a good starting place. Uh, AWS is a little bit more popular, uh, but Azure has some really good uh, free re resources available. You can sign up for a free account at free.azure.com, I believe it is, and they'll actually give you $200 credit for the first month and then 12 months of free services afterwards. And I believe they don't even require a credit card, which is really cool. Um, Definitely recommend you create that free account uh, because nobody wants to get stuck with the uh, with a credit card bill for for like a server that they left on uh, accidentally. The other thing I really like Azure for is that Microsoft has some really great free uh, learning uh, learning content. They have some guided learning paths, individual projects, etc. And these are usually articles or series of articles mixed with videos, mixed with actual links that you can go into the Azure portal and play around with a test environment that they create dynamically for you. It's a really good way of learning um, and, it, and it tends to help a lot of different learning styles and it's free, uh, which, is, which is great. Plus they give you nice little achievements for uh, finishing courses and the like. Um, so uh, I mentioned a second ago, but a word of warning that I, I would like to give you is uh, just a, a story from a student I had last fall. Um, he was really excited to work with Azure and really excited to work and get his database up there so other people could use his web application. And um, he, he selected the wrong tier of database. Um, and he wound, up, he wound up at the end of the month with a $300 bill for a database that really wasn't getting used very much at all. Um, now, thankfully, uh, Microsoft's awesome, and they surprised both of us by, by waiving that fee for him when he reached out to them. But there's no guarantee they'll, they'll do that in your case. Um, so I recommend that you use whatever tools are available to you and whichever cloud provider you're using um, to manage your costs. So automatically track the 
uh, spends, send you notifications when you're going over budgets, or even potentially shut off your servers if you want once you pass a certain price range. Um, so you, you don't want to be that person who left a high-end virtual machine running uh, through the weekend um, and now needs to explain it to your spouse why there's a large charge in your credit card. Um, not that that's happened yet, but I have left a, a server on accidentally when I was teaching APIs, um, which was uh, yeah, yeah, it's still not an amount of money I didn't want to pay. Um, but my number one recommendation to you is that all of these things work. All of these forms of an application work. They all have very different levels of complexity. What do you really need for your organization at its current point in life and where you think it's going to be in about three months? Uh, you know, you don't need microservices if you're working on a hobby project and you're getting 10 requests a day or a week. Uh, you, you, I'm sorry, you don't. It might be fun to play with them, and that's fine. Um, but you don't need that complexity level. Um, I recommend starting small. Uh, my recommendations are generally... In the early stages of an organization, you know, worry about vertical scaling early on. So scale up your database server, scale up your, your web server uh, early on. Um, start off by minifying your JavaScript uh, using something like Webpack. Um, nice thing is if you're using something like React, Angular, Vue.js, uh, they all sort of do that for you auto, out of the box automatically, um, which is really nice. Uh, once you start getting enough issues with your database, you need to start worrying about query optimization, tracking indexes, etc. Once you're at a higher level of usage, you're going to be needing to worry about horizontal scalability of your web server. You're going to need to worry about rate limiting, um, looking at caching, and planning for, for tackling the larger scale database issues. Um, the advanced stage is where you start looking at uh, partitioning your database, uh, splitting into microservices potentially. Um, one caveat to microservices is you need a certain level of maturity for your organization. You need to be able to have a really good level of of uh, log aggregation. You need to have a really good level of uh, CICD, continuous integration, continuous delivery uh, or deployment, depending on who you ask. Um, you need to have a, a significant level of maturity and an organization that's able to communicate well between teams. The microservices really help a large organization scale the work at the people level. Um, had some questions a while ago about books. Um, Actually, the reason why I'm giving this talk is because I've been writing a book uh, intended for newer developers on uh, on application scalability concerns. It's more in depth on things that I've talked about in this talk, as well as stuff that I had to cut for time. Uh, you can find out more at newdevsguide.com, uh, but I'm looking to release that in the fall. Uh, so definitely subscribe to that uh, to the uh, mailing list if you're interested in that. Uh, as far as books that are out now. Uh, or uh, out for more advanced users. Um, my recommendation on software architecture in general would be uh, this Fundamentals of Software Architecture by O'Reilly. Actually, any of the white O'Reilly series on architecture are fantastic. Um, they're typically intermediate or advanced books, um, which is more of why I'm writing um, more of an introductory uh, book. Um, but these are fantastic books. There's also Web Scalability for Startup Engineers, which is a really good uh, resource for folks. Um, this is more of an end-to-end, -end, how do I build an application that scales, uh, covering a lot of different aspects of things. Uh, finally, I got to plug my employer once more. If you're in the Cincy area, you want to, to hire some, some uh, grads, uh, we have a new class graduating uh, next week. Um, reach out to Monica at monica at techelevator.com. If you're interested in getting into tech um, or you know somebody who is, point her in her direction as well, or just take, point them to techelevator.com. We have a lot of really good resources out there. Uh, if you're not in the Cincinnati area, uh, you can talk to Rita. Uh, she is our uh, na national live remote uh, director, as uh, campus director, and she'll be able to plug you into the appropriate campus in your area, or if you're not in an area and want to do a remote learning experience um, from Arizona, let's say, uh, you know, sh she'll hook you up as well. Um, and finally, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, Twitter is usually the best way, uh, but here's my email and LinkedIn as well. And uh, I'll, I'll stop here for, for final questions, et cetera. Uh, but uh, thank you again for having me. Thank you for promoting the event and uh, letting me plug my employer in my book. <laughs> I, do, I do appreciate that. Wow, Matt, thank you so much. That was really a fantastic talk. Can we get a little applause in the chat again for Matt? Uh, so much good content there. Really looking forward to, to hearing about your book. And uh, if you all want, I think you can actually sign up for info 
about the book on that website. So definitely check that out. I posted that in the chat a little bit ago. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, definitely. I normally ask people if there's anything you want to call out, but uh, it's all right there right now. Um, Actually, I didn't want to call out. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, sorry, Barking Terrier, but at least he waited to the end of the talk. Uh, I would love to meet you if you want to if you want to hang out at the end of the Zoom Zoom talk. I always love to ask what 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 things folks are working wor uh, working on. I know Michael, you were going to plug that, but uh, I'm just eager to meet folks. Absolutely. So, uh, if you do have questions, if you have feedback, that is so valuable for speakers. I would definitely encourage you to to pass that along either in the the post presentation Zoom or uh, by messaging Matt. Uh, he, I, he seems to have already put that out there, so I don't think that I'm not uh, <laughs> put it, uh, you know, putting him up for that. But uh, yeah, if there, is there any questions that you want to take right now, or do you want to wait until after, and we, do we can move the, the giveaway, or what would you prefer, Matt? Uh, it's up to you. I'm I'm all good. So I think looking at time, maybe we'll go ahead and move things along. And then we can we can get to the Zoom and, and conquer some of the questions there. Sounds All right. Good. Thanks, Matt. And okay. Folks can email me as well if they have questions. Absolutely. So, all right. As promised, we are giving away a JetBrains license. So, Cat has everything queued up. All you have to do is type hashtag CSC in the chat and that will register for you the giveaway then there's Mubot coming in uh giving you all the details so um while we're doing that while you sign up for the giveaway while we're waiting for everybody to sign up make sure that you are svp for next month's talk and add it to your calendar um we don't want you to miss this one it's really going to be fantastic i'm going to go ahead and uh post the link in here momentarily. There we are. So check that one out. Um, you can RSVP on LinkedIn or Meetup. Looks like we've still got some entries coming in here. Lots of them today. So um, we'll give it about 10 more seconds to let people get their entries in, and then we'll draw the winner. If we do draw your name, make sure that um, you um, res so respond to somehow connect with Kat after the fact. Oh, we're, they're still coming. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give a, a countdown and then at, at five. We, we count down for five and then we're done. We're going to draw, okay? Five, four, three. I'm just realizing there's a delay. Two, one. All right, go ahead and draw cat. And we'll see that appear in the chat when cat does the drawing. So again, check out next month's talk. Go ahead and sign up for that. All right, Pablo has won. Congratulations, Pablo, and winning the free JetBrains license. Excellent, and just to close us out, I wanna thank all of you attendees. We love you, and we are so happy that you're here. You uh, are why we do this. So we would be delighted to hear any feedback that you have for us. Let us know what you enjoyed. Let us know what we could have done better. We're actively working to make this meetup better every month, and we need your feedback to help make it great. So um, with that, I hope that you'll join us on Zoom for the post-presentation social time. You can find that link on, link on the LinkedIn event or the meetup event, and we're, about, we're gonna post it 
And Randy took care of it. Post it in the chat right now. So feel free to, to, to jump on that link and uh, meet with us in Zoom. So without further ado, I bid you all good evening, and I look forward to seeing you on the Zoom chat. Thank you.